this channel. I'll be talking about whatever I fucking want. In the era of desperation, people who are mostly not an avid television news viewer have long complained in the past about how the news media is fake news or that they're not trustworthy or even that they claim the news media makes false and defamatory stories and news reports about that particular person they like. So those types of guys like Nicholas Sandman, known for his signature look, if you know what I mean, which dates all the way back in 2019, has lost a lawsuit last year back in July 2022. The major news media outlets won the lawsuit against Nicholas Sandman because William O. Bert Talsman, a District of Kentucky federal judge, had to terminate Nicholas Sandman's lawsuit for not having merit, which is why Nicholas lost against the news media. After years of politically charged litigation, former Covington Catholic High School student Nick Sandman on Tuesday lost a round of high-profile defamation lawsuits against five mainstream media companies at the summary judgment stage. That's according to court documents and an opinion and order signed by a federal judge in the Eastern District of Kentucky. Sandman's cases against ABC News, Rolling Stone Magazine, CBS News, newspaper and television station owner Gannett, and the New York Times are now officially listed as terminated on the court record. Which, of course, in my view, is a good thing because you know I happily love when uh, news media outlets get to exercise their First Amendment right to report the news and to you know share the stories around as to what is happening in our daily lives and it is good to see that last year which happened at at the time that the failed lawsuit would be overturned and I hope that the same news media outlets keep fighting against Nicholas Sandman's despicable tyrant lawsuit because he himself has nothing to show for. ABC's reporting conveyed the false and defamatory charges that Nicholas stood in Phillips his way, blocked Phillips his way and wouldn't allow Phillips to retreat, and that Nicholas wouldn't let Phillips move, while a mass of other young white boys swarmed, taunted, cheered, and physically imitated Phillips. ABC's reporting conveyed, among other things, the false and defamatory gifts that Nicholas was the base of an unruly hate mob of hundreds of white racist high school students who physically assaulted and harassed Native Americans who were engaged in peaceful demonstrations, song, and prayer at the National Mall. First of all, ABC's reporting did not convey the false and defamatory charges. Because it was all true. We all saw it in 2019. And the fact that the lawyers 
for attorneys of Nicholas Sandman would go out their way to make this excruciatingly defamatory false claim about what ABC News did is completely reprehensible and dishonest. Because ABC News would never report false and defamatory charges about Nicholas Sandman. All of what his attorneys or lawyers, whatever you want to call them, are trying to do is to not let this young man at the time back in 2019 take responsibility for his own actions because he's the one that went towards the guy in the first place or at least has blocked in the middle of Nathan Phillips's way when he was in the middle of protesting and he most definitely should not have blocked Nathan Hills' his way, knowing that there was a protest going on. That's what happened. ABC accuses Nicholas of behavior constituting menacing racial intimidation of Phillips, a Native American political activist, while Phillips was perpetrated. Per reportedly engaged in peaceful song and prayer at the Lincoln Memorial. ABC News did not accuse Nicholas of anything. In fact, Nicholas Sandman's lawyers have really not thought this through when it comes to presenting evidence and clearly a lot of what I'm reading shows me that they don't have the evidence to back up their claims which is why we're gonna get into what the judge says now Actually, I lied. There is one more to read in this article as to what his lawyers are saying. ABC's accusations against Nicholas are totally, probably, and unequivocally false. The truth is, after the the indigenous people's march was over, Phillips approached Nicholas and the other students from a bar, bypass wide open steps to his alleged destination of the Lincoln Memorial, specifically confronted Nicholas, and never intended to move past, around, or away from Nicholas, as Nicholas stood quietly for several minutes in a Make America Great Again ad while Phillips became beat a drum and sang loudly within inches of Nicholas's face. Nope, ABC News' accusations is not totally, probably, and unequivocally false. That's not true. And no, the people the indigenous people's march wasn't over. It was still going. And Nicholas Sandman was right in the middle of the protest. You, 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 you cannot simply think that a child wouldn't know that when he or she steps in front of the 
Native American man or woman to complete his protesting ritual that he does every year at the Indigenous People's March. You wouldn't think that this child should have just step aside and I don't know actually move to to the bus stop where his classmates are supposed to be instead of just standing there looking for trouble If I were Nicholas Sandman, I would have just done that. I would just move out of the way and I would just, or I would just like keep walking and head towards the bus stop and wait for the bus because that is absolutely better than having to at least stand there and see what Nathan Phillips was gonna do if he didn't attempt to move around which is what he isn't supposed to do at an indigenous people's march you got in their way, you should be the one to move around. You shouldn't interrupt the protest. The truth is that at the time of the confrontation by Phillips, Nicholas and his classmates from Covington Catholic High School were assembled on the stairs of the Lincoln Memorial at the direction of their chaperones for buses that would take them home to Northern Kentucky. The truth is that Nicholas and his Cove Cav classmates were bullied, attacked, and confronted with racist and homophobic slurs and threats of violence by the black Hebrew Israelites, a recognized hate group, before being unexpectedly confronted without explanation by Phillips, an activist who proceeded to target Nicholas while chanting and beating a drum inches from his face and being flanked by activist companions healing the event in the hopes of capturing a viral sensation that would be used to events via social media. An ulterior political agenda, Phillips specifically targeted Nicholas and placed himself directly in front of Nicholas. All of what Nicholas Sandman's attorneys are saying isn't true at all because Nathan Phillips didn't came up to Nicholas Sandman first. Nicholas Sandman blocked Nathan Phillips' way as Nathan Phillips was in the middle of protesting. Nicholas was in Nathan's line of way to protest. Plus, the chaperones are to blame for not telling the Covington Catholic High School students to move out of the way because if they're assembling on the stairs but yet somebody was protesting in the indigenous march then the least these people can do who were chaperoning the students is to tell the students to move out of the fucking way also the black hebrew israelites did not bully or attack the Copeton Catholic students. They were not at, at all doing that. Did the Black Hebrew Israelites use the word cracker? 
Yes. They said the word cracker towards the people who were waiting for the school buses. But in no way were the Covington Catholic students were bullied and attacked. There is no video evidence of that from anywhere. All parties moved for various forms of summary judgment and a judge agreed to dismiss the cases by agreeing with the five media defendants and disagreeing with Sedman's attorneys, senior U.S. District Judge William O. Burlesman and Jimmy Carter appointee explained in the procedural manifestations afoot. The cases are now before the court on motions filed in all five pending cases. Plaintiff's motions for partial summary judgment on the issue of falsity. Defendant's joint motion for summary judgment. Defendant's supplemental mandorama in support of summary judgment. And defendant's motions to strike. Summary judgment is a procedural mechanism which resolves cases without a trial. In that opinion, the court held that none of these statements were actionable for various reasons. Some were not about Sandman, some were statements of opinion, and slash or some were not subject to a defamatory meaning. Okay, so that means that Nicholas Sandman's attorneys did not have the proper evidence to back their claims. In other words, the case more or less flatlined once before. Sandman filed a motion to reconsider. The judge agreed to hesitate the matter on narrow grounds. At issue in the resurrected case, there were Phillips statements that Sandman had blocked Phillips and would not allow him to retreat, the judge wrote. Justice required that discovery be conducted as to the context of those statements. So, in other words, Nicholas Sandman's lawyers didn't have all the context. Got it. That makes sense. Brolo's man noted that the only evidence filed in the record consists of one, Sandman's deposition. Two, a declaration under oath by Phillips. Three, seven declarations under oath by persons in attendance at the incident. And four, a collection of video recordings taken at the National Mall that day. Although lengthy, Sandman's deposition contains relatively little testimony pertinent to the issues at hand. That means Nicholas Sandman's case wasn't good enough to begin with. A little more than a page of bullet points recapped what the judge considered the salient point of that deposition among them were the following. Sandman served as Phil's moved toward and then through the group of students. Some students moved out of Phillips' way as he walked forward. Sandman felt that Phillips was trying to imitate the students by walking right up to them when he could have taken several other routes around them. So Sandman felt he wanted to stand up for school. At the time, he did not know Phillips' intent was to get up to the Lincoln Memorial, which is what Nathan Phillips was trying to do at the Indigenous People's March. We all saw the video. That's what he was trying to do. Phillips stood so close to Sandman that his drum touched Sandman's shoulder. His spit was getting on Sandman's face and Sandman could smell Phillips' breath. The steps where I see and Stan then was concerned that if he moved, he might slip and fall. Sandman felt he was being mature by remaining calm and standing his ground in a tense situation. A declaration from Phillips provided the following details the judge wrote. As he approached the students, Phillips felt that the crowd was swarming and surrounding me. As Phillips began to move towards the Lincoln Memorial, students moved out of his way. However, Sandman appeared to position himself in front of Phillips. Phillips declares, It was very much my experience that Mr. Sandman was blocking me from exiting the situation. 
it was very much my experience that he intentionally stood in my way in order to stop me from moving forward. See, I knew that key information was in there somewhere. I felt surrounded in that space, and I believe Mr. Sandman did not want to let me pass. It seemed to me that Mr. Sandman felt that he needed to start stand there and block my way. A group of six other witnesses declared that Phillips moved toward Sandman, according to the judge. Those six witnesses were in Washington, D.C. to attend the Indigenous People's March, which attracted Phillips. The order attests only one previously knew Phillips. Five of the six individuals ever heard that it was their impression that Sam and Block Phillips were moving forward. I have a very good feeling that this case wasn't going to hold up well for Sandman, which is good. Because the freedom of the press depends on it. As noted above, the court expressly held that while the allegations of Salmon's complaints passed the possibility test at the pleading stage and that the discovery should be had on the context of Phillips' statement, the actionability of the statements would be revisited on summary judgment. Sandman's insists that the court cannot now revisit this legal issue is ironic considering he vigorously and successfully moved the court to reconsider its initial ruling in the Washington Post case. I'm going to read a few more things to you and then I'll come up with my own in conclusion. In sum, the law of the case doctrine does not preclude this court from reconsidering a new on summary judgment legal issues raised at the pleading stage. In other words, in the light of the terse discovery, Salmon's claim failed. Specifically as to the claim that Salmon blocked Phillips from advancing Burlingsman rules as follows. Applying the above legal authorities and lift the benefit of a more delicate record. The court concludes that Phillips' statement that Sandman blocked him and wouldn't allow him to retreat are objectively unverifiable and thus unactionable opinions. Instead, a reasonable reader would understand that Phillips was simply condemning his view of the situation. And because the reader knew from the articles that this encounter occurred at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial, he or she would know that confrontation occurred in an expansive area such that it would be difficult to know what might constitute blocking another person in that setting. Judge Boseman then criticized Hammond's lawyers for arguing parents that the evidence doesn't support. Interestingly, plaintiff's response memorandum to the joint motion for summary judgment argues that blocking is a factual because it involves the oppositional position that of two human bodies in a confined space. But as the videos depicted, the area where this encounter occurred was a huge outdoor setting, not confined space. Later, Burlesque Man suggested that the press did little more than to report Phyllis's version of the event. Phyllis's version of the events were opinions, not facts, the judge concluded. The media defendants were covering a matter of great public interest and they reported Phyllis's first person view of what he experienced. This would put the reader on notice that Phyllis was simply giving his perspective on the incident. Therefore, in the factual context of, the, of this case, Mrs. Blocking statements are protected opinions, most rationed. This holding moots all other motions before the court. And finally, the court has reached its conclusions with the fealty to law as its primary concern of no consideration of the grand course political debate associated with these cases. Obviously, the ruling yesterday was a disappointment for my family and I. I'm appealing the decision in the Sixth Circuit. 
Josh Bill's man revisited Aitman that I blocked Nathan Phillips and would not allow him to retreat. If they were factual claims, I could proceed a, and a jury would then decide if they were defamatory. But if they were opinions, it is speech that I cannot sue for. The judge ruled that the media companies publish opinion. The problem is it isn't. X did Y is very different from I believe X is Y. And then he gives an example, blah, 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 who cares? And then Nicholas Simon says towards the end, nevertheless, I have learned how to be patient the will to move forward. I am going to continue on that path. My quick in conclusion is Nathan Phillips was giving his perspective on the incident to which the news media reported on. At the end of the day, CBS News, ABC News, and Gannett were in their First Amendment right to report the news or give an odd bed, which is not defamatory toward you. Thank you.